it's a Friday morning and also a fresh new day of a new series as well. That's the December series. We have a lot of cues, be it global, most importantly, a lot of domestic cues that we'll discuss during the course of the show. The biggest one being GDP beating estimates across all parameters. But before we discuss the domestic cues, let's take a look at what the Asian markets are doing. It was a mixed handover that we got from the Wall Street. Dow notched a new high. But today we are seeing uh, quite a mixed picture even in the Asian markets. The Taiwanese index uh, down 36 points. We have the Hang Seng, which is sitting with cuts of around 60 points. Beat Cosby, which is lower by 8 tenths of a percent or something like a Shanghai which is lower as well. So largely, I have to say it's a red screen in the Asian markets. But if you look at the GIFT Nifty, that should come up for you on the screen. And that one is indicating that the start for our own market could be a gap up. It's a 65 point implied open uh, that uh, the GIFT Nifty is suggesting right now. At that 20,334 uh, mark right now, if we compare it with Nifty 50 futures because of the stellar GDP data that we got. So we'll watch out for that one. But yes, looking like a good start for Indian markets today. And in the U.S. markets now, Wall Street ended Thursday's trading session mixed with the Dow Jones jumping over 500 points to a new high for the year. The S&P up 17 points and the Nasdaq Composite closed with losses of 32 points. The Dow closed out November with an 8.9% gain, breaking its three-month losing streak. The S&P 500 rose 8.9% in November, while the Nasdaq advanced 10.7%. The Fed's most preferred gauge, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index, rose 0.2% for the month and 3.5% annually, in line with expectations, giving the Fed some room to hold rates or possibly start cut in 2024. Let us now listen into some important opinion coming in from experts on the outlook for the market, inflation and what the Fed could do next. So I think there's been good information in November that warranted this multi-asset rally we've had in stocks, in bonds, in credit, in FX. Um, and I think really the information there was the taking off the table of certain risks. So taking off the table the risk that inflation reaccelerates, that the Fed has further hikes to do, that gasoline prices would keep spiking, that we'd have a government shutdown, or that data wouldn't slow down enough. It doesn't mean there aren't risks. It doesn't mean things are perfect. I think it just means that certain tail risks have been avoided. Right now, activity is moderating, inflation is cooling. As we get into next year, that picture may become more complicated. We'll probably have some sticky inflation and a further slowing in activity. We don't think the Fed's going to hike again. Um, it really looked like they were going to up until we saw Treasury yields move higher. And then all of the rhetoric has gone the other way. I think that's part of the reason that Treasury yields are lower now, that equity prices are higher now. The Fed really signaling they're probably done with rate hikes here. Okay, it's time to get to the final update on our global market wrap this morning. European markets ended Thursday's trading session higher with the French CAC up 43 points, the German DAX surging close to 49 points and the British FTSE closing with gains of 30 points. The pan-European stock 600 closed 0.5% higher and posted its biggest monthly jump since January. In important macro cues from the region, inflation in the eurozone slowed to 2.4% in November from 2.9% in October and well below the forecasted 2.7% fall. Okay, that's all the global market uh, action, but we have a lot of domestic cues as well, right? So let's talk about how these overnight cues and our own cues impact the movement that we'll see in our own markets. We have a research team joining in to tell you just that. This is our Power Prep segment. Guys, a very good morning and happy Friday to all of you. Uh, Ekta, let me come across to you first up. Looks like it could be a Friday party for our own markets as well. Morning, Sonal. Well, yes, it seems to be a happy day for our Indian equity markets as well. So I'll just recap what took place yesterday. The Nifty ended above 20,100. So we've already scaled past those levels. The Nifty Bank, however, snapped its four-day gaining streak and the mid-cap rally continued. So it ended higher. The mid-caps ended higher for the 20th straight session. Now, in terms of FII flows, strong. That is also because there was the MSCI rebalancing yesterday. DII's net sold around 780-odd crores. Macros are the big Q today. So extremely supportive GDP data for the uh, for Q2, which is coming at 7.6% versus a poll of 7.03% and versus 6.2% on a year on year basis and versus 7.8% on a Q on Q basis. Core sector data for the month of October has been extremely strong as well at around 12.1% versus 9.2% on a month on month basis. Fiscal deficit was better for October, which came in at around 1.02 lakh crore versus 1.38 lakh crore year on year. So the macro setup seems to be positive 
for our markets and the global set setup is positive as well so the US markets ended higher we have oil which is still at around 82 dollars per barrel so no change there and we have Asia which is largely weak but the gift nifty which is in indicating an implied open in the green uh, mainly it will be the domestic queues to watch out for so the other big queue to watch out for will be the exit polls which came out last evening any kind of uh, impact on our in on our markets but remember that the eventual final result will be on Sunday we have auto sales today so that might corroborate what we are seeing in the GDP data the commentary will be important it is a high frequency indicator we have the S&P global manufacturing PMI for India today banking sector momentum as well and we have flair writing which is going to join the list of the recent listings so that will be another one to watch for okay all right uh, thank you so much Ekta for all those cues but a lot of stocks that will be on our radar as well Hormaz has that list uh, good morning Hormaz good morning Sonal plenty of them as always and Ultratech Cement is the one CNBC TV 18's news break got confirmed last evening when they announced that they'll be acquiring Kesoram Cement business and Kesoram will be demerging that cement business now into Ultratech now in lieu of uh, this Ultratech will be issuing one equity share for 52 shares of Kesoram and the deal values Kesoram at a 25 percent premium to Thursday's closing price. Now, Whirlpool of India, well, parent company, which is Whirlpool Corporation, now plans to sell 24% stake next year in one or more tranches. They intend to retain a majority stake. They currently hold 75%. Uh, so after that, it will be down to 51%. And the stake sale proceeds will be used to reduce debt. Now, Hindustan Aeronautics, where the Defence Acquisition Council approved the procurement of light combat helicopters and light combat aircraft MK-1A, uh, Thomas Cook, the OFS that opened yesterday, they are going to exercise the green shoe option now. It will be open for the retail investors in today's session. TCS, the share buyback is opening today. They intend to buy back 4.2 crore shares at 41.50 rupees through the tender of a route. Uh, SIS, the board has approved a buyback. It is a 90 crore buyback. They will be doing it via tender of a process. And the buyback price of 550 rupees is a 13% premium to Thursday's closing price. ITD Cementation, they have won a 1,000 crore order in Andhra Pradesh. And lastly, Moil, which has cut the prices of some manganese ore and other products by 5% in the month of November. Back to you. Okay, that is a long list, Orma. Thank you so much for joining us. But we have to talk about the FNO space. It's a fresh new series. Mangnam is joining in with all the cues. Morning, Mangnam. Good morning. It is indeed a fresh new series. In fact, when we look back at the November series at the start, you know, the street was looking at the bottom of the barrel with Nifty below that 19,000 mark. The FI longs just around 11%. But boy, those shots were surprised. And as a result of which, the Nifty saw nearly 1,300 point gain in November itself. And how does that compare with the previous series? Well, in terms of absolute points, it's the best series that we've seen since Feb 2021. And if you look at the percentage terms as well, it is the best that we've seen since July 2022. The Nifty gained around 6.8% in the Feb series, uh, rather in the November series itself. Last five December series, now as, as we look at December, important to know, December has been a bit of a chill month where we see a bit of profit taking. Four out of five December months have seen negative, mild negative returns, but one of them actually saw a big up move as well. So that's something we need to watch out for. In terms of rollovers have been, you know, largely on the lower side, 73% as compared to 79%. But that's because a lot of the shots didn't roll their positions over. The Nifty open interest at the start of the series is around 1 crore shares, pretty much in line with what we've seen as an average in the last uh, three series itself. Now, the shots didn't roll over a lot of their positions as a result of which the Nifty long positions at the start of this series is 36%, a lot higher than what we saw at the start of November series as well. But is this 31% to 36% very good? Turns out not, because in the recent past, wherever a Nifty series has started with FII long exposure between 30 to 40 percent, it's turned out the series has seen negative returns. So if you just take a look at it, you know, Feb 2021, the Nifty, uh, you know, started with FIIs seeing 7, 33 percent long positions. We saw an 862 point decline. May 2022, the FIIs started the series with 35 percent, a thousand point decline. As recent as October 2023 as well, the FIIs started with 31 percent long exposure. We saw 666 point decline. December 2023, we start with 36 percent long exposure let's see where we go this series especially because we put a big move behind us as well but important to watch out for a couple of cues and triggers for this series one will be the indian state election results then we have the rbi policy outcome on december 8th thereafter in the globe itself we'll watch out for what you know the u.s fed speak is and u.s yields 
There is low global liquidity in the holiday season, second half of December, but that also coincides with the Santa Claus rally. Do we get that or not? Well, for starters, the first day of December series is very positive. Let's see where we go from here. Okay, all right. Thank you guys for joining us uh, and prepping us up for this trading day ahead. It's time for a short break now. When we return, India's GDP growth in the second quarter has beaten estimates. Growth has accelerated by 7.6%. More on that when we return. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast on CNBC TV 18. Let's talk about the uh, important domestic macro queue. In a pleasant surprise, uh, India's GDP grew by 7.6% in the second quarter. This is higher than CNBC TV 18's poll of 7.03% and way more than Reserve Bank's uh, forecast of 6.5%. Lata Venkatesh is here with the numbers and her take on this as well. Yes, that's right. The second quarter GDP number is a blistering 7.6%. And now if you take the April-September number, uh, the first half has grown at 7.7%. Can't remember last when India grew so well, perhaps in the 2004 to 2008 period. It's been helped largely and surprisingly by manufacturing. Agriculture has been a disappointment at 1.2. And services have been tepid. You know, trade, hotels, transport and communication. A big services sector has grown by just 4.3%. Financial services by only about 6%. And government, uh, public administration and other services by only 7.6%. I'm saying only 76 because it's not even as good as the overall GDP. But manufacturing grown at 13.9%. Construction, 133 And electricity, power, utilities... 10%, mining 10%. So the entire industry segment is the one that has pushed uh, uh, the uh, economy higher. India was always a services-led economy, but this quarter has been different. Just a word on uh, GDP from the demand side. I mean, uh, agriculture industries from the output side. From the demand side, personal final consumption expenditure is a disappointment. Uh, it's grown by only 3.1%, but government final consumption expenditure has grown 12.3%. And gross fixed capital formation by a handsome 11%. So that part of the economy in terms of government uh, consumption and in terms of capex is doing very well. Personal consumption and services like trade still need to pick up. But all told, a blistering number is going to lead to an upgrade of India across equity markets and uh, by economists as well. Lata, thank you so much for joining us with your take. Meanwhile, the Chief Economic Advisor, V. Nageshwaran, said he sees an upside to the FY24 GDP target of 6.5%. Listen in to what he had to say. In terms of the projections, therefore, obviously these numbers impart a certain upside to the 6.5% estimate for real GDP growth in the current financial year. But uh, we will have to work the numbers to see what kind of uh, upside uh, that this current numbers impart for the full year estimate. So until then, we will keep the estimate at 6.5%, except to signal that we are now probably more comfortable with this number than we were before. There are two possibilities. Either the moment tax buoyancy is very high, or it could very well be the case that we are still, uh, the economic activity in real ter in actual terms is more than what we are estimating. And obviously, if we are saying that the real economic activity is higher in nominal terms, it would also mean that economic activity will be greater in constant prices as well. Okay, all right, uh, let's move on now in what could be a big news for the Indian automobile sector. The JSW Group and China's SAIC Motor, MG Motor's parent company, have announced a strategic joint venture that would focus mainly on green mobility. Parikshit Lutra is joining us with more details on this. Parikshit? This is indeed big news for the Indian automobile sector. The JSW Group and MG Motor India will be coming together for a joint venture. This has been speculated for a few months now and CNBC TV 18 has also reported on this. Now we can confirm the JSW Group will be picking up a 35% stake in MG Motor India as per the terms of this joint venture. Both companies will work together on uh, increasing the localization of component and uh, work towards uh, electric vehicles and green mobility, also increasing charging infrastructure around the country. In fact, we are getting to know from our sources that JSW Group wants to enter the electric vehicle space in a 
big way. They want to uh, get a big pie of the electric vehicle market and also want to localize heavily over the next few years. What does MG Motor get through this? MG Motor's proposals, especially on FDI, had been... Uh, uh, pending with the Indian government for the last few years. MG Motor India is owned by China's SAIC Motor. Uh, these talks with JSW had been going on. MG had earlier announced in May that they have a plan to completely Indianize the company and divest majority stake to an Indian company and uh, other private equity investors and other shareholders for that matter. So for the moment, a 35% stake has been uh, picked up by JSW Group. Uh, what we will see in the next few years is work towards an IPO as well and a complete Indianization of the firm as MG Motor has earlier spoken about. Parikshit, thank you so much for joining us with those important details. We'll keep coming back to you as and when there are more updates on this one. We'll sip into a break. Up next, we'll get you all the cues from the commodities markets. So stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Well, a lot is happening in the world of commodities as well. The outcome of the OPEC Plus meet, so that's important to track. Manisha Gupta is joining us with all the update. Hey, Manisha, good morning. Hi, morning, and thank you for that. Well, yes, uh, you know, the crude oil prices uh, have slipped post the OPEC and Allies meeting. We are also headed for a second monthly decline. We are down by 7% for the month of November. Well, the OPEC and Allies have, uh, what they have done is they've done voluntary output cuts for the first quarter of 2024 at around 2.2 million barrels per day, which is much, uh, you know, short than what the street was anticipating. And out of this 2.2, 1.3 is being cut by Saudi Arabia and Russia itself. 900,000 that is remaining. Out of that also, 200,000 is yet again taken by Russia. So you have barely a 700,000 barrels per day of an output cut coming in from OPEC and allies, which is much lesser. And within that as well, barring UAE and Iraq, the street anticipates that most of the African countries and other countries, which are just about coming back now, could be producing more. So we are looking at perhaps a surplus and not a deficit, and that's going on to the markets. Okay, all right. Take your point. So that's what's happening with crude oil prices down 7% in November. Thank you, Manisha, for joining us. But moving on, voting in Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Telangana, Chhattisgarh and Mizoram. They, it has concluded with the results due to be announced on Sunday. And here is what exit polls are suggesting. In Rajasthan, exit polls suggest the BJP will return to power as the state has historically changed parties every election. Madhya Pradesh is promising to be a cliffhanger where the BJP and the Congress are heading towards a photo finish. Telangana promises to be a cliffhanger as well. The Bharat Rashtra Samiti tally may reduce significantly. With the Congress likely to win the state in Chhattisgarh, all polls are giving Congress the edge. While in Mizoram, none of the polls are giving the ruling MNF or the Congress a complete majority. Okay, this will be interesting to track, so we'll keep getting you more updates on that. Uh, but before we wrap on the show, let's quickly talk about COP28 because the first day concluded yesterday and there was a big update because there has been some pledge which has come by for the loss and damage fund. Uh, now, uh, this is a fund to help the world's poorest and vulnerable, vulnerable countries which are hit by climate change in order to get over this and to help them get uh, past the impact of climate change and change in weathers as well. So countries who have agreed to contribute to this fund include UAE, which has contributed around $100 million, Germany also a similar amount. From USA, it's around $17 million that they have promised to contribute. UK is around $75 million and Japan around $10 million. In total, it's more than $420 million that will be contributed to the fund for now. There could be an upgrade to this number as well. And it is important, it was announced back in COP27 that they will form this loss and damage fund to help developing and poor nations fight the problem of climate change and weather change as well. And now there has been some progress made. So that is a good news coming, especially it happened on the first day of this climate conference happening in Dubai. With that, we'll do one thing. We'll take your leave on this edition of Power Breakfast, but do stay tuned. Bazaar Morning Call comes up next. Promises to be a good day for our own market, so track all the market action there.